North King Street, Dublin, Ireland, April 26th, 1916. Crouched behind captured barricades, a British officer issues the order every soldier dreads. Fix bayonets! His platoon complies, sliding the long blades onto their Lee Enfield rifles. A momentary pause as the soldiers wait, collecting their courage. Charge! Shouting, the British surge over the barricades and up the street. Rifle fire booms from the tall, tightly packed buildings surrounding them and blasts out from a barricaded pub. The officer leading the charge takes a bullet. His men drop, killed or wounded. The attack lasts mere seconds, as without cover, the soldiers are easy targets for the Irish nationalists sheltering behind the street barricades. The survivors withdraw. Wasting no time, a few nationalists, desperate to replenish their supplies, leap from cover to grab weapons and ammunition from the slain. And they'll need every round, for blood is now trickling into the gutters of North King Street. And as more men give their lives for the conflict, and more civilians find themselves caught in the crossfire, that trickle soon swells to a torrent. This episode is brought to you by, well, you, our lovely patrons over at Patreon. To hear about how you can vote on history topics we make shows about, and some pretty neat new stuff in the EC merch store, please stay tuned until after the episode. Two days after the start of the Easter Rising, British efforts were focused on isolating and crushing small Irish nationalist enclaves that had dug in throughout Dublin city centre. The Four Courts and neighboring North King Street, where the British launched their doomed bayonet charge, was one such rebel stronghold. The area was a tangle of slum housing and narrow streets and alleys, a nightmare for any attacker. So the British mostly tried to tunnel through walls, going from one building into the next rather than risk the open street. Nationalists fired from windows and rooftops, or from behind their barricades, some moving from house to house to ensure they kept the element of surprise. And the British claimed that when cornered, the rebels would throw away their weapons and pretend to be civilians, even going so far as to use women as shields. Now, this may have been true, or it may have simply been a justification to excuse what happened next, or it might have been both. By Friday, the bloodshed around the four courts still showed no sign of ending, and furious at the casualties sustained, British soldiers burst into a series of homes late Friday night. In an event that became known as the North King Street Massacre, they shot or bayoneted 15 unarmed men, none of whom were taking part in the Rising. Such were the realities of rebellion. For the Nationalists, North King Street was just another example of British brutality, added to centuries of oppression and injustice. And to the British, North King Street was the inevitable result of the Nationalists intentionally blurring the lines between soldiers and civilians, thus bringing death and ruination down upon their own people. And as the uprising raged on, many Dubliners actually shared that British view. They saw the rising as a betrayal of the homeland, especially since hundreds of thousands of Irishmen, including Irish nationalists, were giving their lives in the struggle overseas against Imperial Germany. But regardless, as the brutal fighting near the four courts dragged on, it quickly became clear that it would not be the bloodiest engagement that day. Northumberland Road, Dublin, Ireland, that same day. A column of British soldiers march along the street through a leafy, well-to-do part of Dublin. They are reinforcements heading into the city. Fresh troops, newly arrived from London, and most just out of basic training. One man, Adjutant Captain Frederick Christian Dietrichson, briefly falls out of ranks to greet a woman and two children. They are Dietrichson's wife, son, and daughter. The captain had sent for them from London, moving them to Ireland in hopes to avoid the threat of German Zeppelin bombings. He could have never imagined an even greater danger awaited them here. But for now, he's relieved to see that his family is safe, and they, for their part, will never see him again. Just a few minutes later, Dietrichson and nine other soldiers die in a rebel ambush not far from Mount Street Bridge. Caught in the open, the inexperienced soldiers suffer terrible losses, and rather than retreat, they're ordered to press on. So they did, marching directly into a disaster. At Mount Street Bridge, spanning the Grand Canal, those British reinforcements struggled against a small detachment of dug-in rebels. Ill-equipped and inexperienced, they suffered 216 casualties, accounting for two-thirds of all of the British Army losses during the Rising. In addition, around 20 civilians were also killed or wounded, while trying to help fallen British soldiers caught in the open. Elsewhere, at the Mendicity Institution Charity Building, 26 Irish volunteers made a stand against repeated British assaults. Enduring sniper fire and a hail of bullets from machine guns, the outpost continued to resist until they ran out of ammunition. 
And this was just one of many similar incidents across the city. For the Nationalists, fighting from the Northumberland Hotel to the South Dublin Union, all of whom had resolved to take up arms despite the odds, this rising was the ultimate moment of reckoning, the struggle they believed they had inherited from their forefathers. Further west, at the South Dublin Union, more brutal close combat played out. The fighting went from building to building, and room to room, as the British attempted to pry the rebels from their positions. Some of the structures in the complex were taken, but others remained in the hands of the volunteers. The rebels fought for every inch, and when one nationalist officer was severely wounded, he ordered his men to leave him behind while he continued to fight on, alone, armed only with his pistol. Though frontal assaults were the order of the day in some parts of the city, in others, the nationalists were instead subjected to ranged bombardment. British artillery opened fire on Wednesday from Trinity College and Fibsboro, supported by a gunboat that had sailed up the River Liffey. The relentless shelling killed volunteers and civilians alike, and kept most of the rebels pinned down. In a matter of days, the grand architecture of several Dublin neighborhoods had been reduced to rubble. Meanwhile, outside Dublin, counter-orders had ensured that most of the Irish volunteers beyond the city stayed at home. Others mustered but didn't engage in combat, and in Cork, Roman Catholic clergy successfully persuaded the volunteers to surrender their weapons to the British army. Though elsewhere, a few chose to ignore their directives and fight anyway. The largest entanglement outside Dublin occurred to the north of the city where an Irish volunteer battalion convinced a string of Royal Irish Constabulary stations to surrender. The last one did so only after a five-hour-long firefight that left eight policemen and five volunteers dead. Despite this, there was still next to no support for the uprising from the general Irish populace, so the success or failure of the rising would ultimately hinge on the events playing out in Dublin. Sackville Street, April 29, 1916 the General Post Office is in flames, its ruins blazing as a pail of black smoke joins the dozens of smudges already blotting the Dublin skyline. However, the structure is mercifully abandoned. The nationalist leadership who fought from it have evacuated at the last minute, tunneling through walls to escape the all-consuming fire. They set up a new command post in nearby Moore Street. Every one of them, from the newest volunteer right up the chain of command to Pierce himself, is exhausted. Some are wounded, some dying. James Connolly has taken a bullet to the leg. Food, water, ammunition, and medical supplies, all of it is almost gone. The volunteers called, but Ireland has not answered. They have no more left to give. Pierce knows that the cost to the city has already been appalling, and fighting to the death will only lead to more civilian casualties. So reluctantly, he orders his men to lay down their arms and sends a message to the British asking for terms. The Easter Rising is over. Pierce, Connolly, and the other leaders of the uprising in Dublin are taken into captivity. It takes a few days for the surrender orders to reach the various pockets of rebel resistance, and after the high emotion and intense combat, many are reluctant to give up their weapons. This had been their chance, their moment to change the history of their country and avenge centuries of oppression, and yet they'd failed. When the last of them finally submitted, the cost of the uprising became clear. At the final count, 126 British soldiers, including 35 from Irish regiments, had been killed along with 17 policemen, and among the nationalists, 66 had died. But the greatest number of dead were the civilians, 260 in all, with thousands more wounded. Parts of Dublin were in ruins from shelling, and smoke continued to cloud the sky for days. But while the fighting may have been over, the dying hadn't yet run its course because in defeat, the Easter Rising and the British response to it would serve as a fault line that would break Ireland apart. You know, one of the main reasons we're able to make extra history episodes like the one you just watched is thanks to the insane generosity of all of the fantastic folks like you who are patrons over on our Patreon. And if you'd like to join our Patreon community, not only would you be helping us create the content that you love, but you'll also have options like suggesting and voting on extra history topics that turn into actual episodes, which I'm still floored by all of your suggestions. Uh, they're so awesome to read every time we do the poll. You get access to our lovely official Discord where it's just wholesome as heck and lots of great discussions happen. You get to view all of our shows early and snag some exclusive things like 4K wallpapers and some never before seen digital posters. Side note, shout out to the artists on those. Actually, shout out to all the artists all the time. They're killing it on everything we do, including this ad read. So please give them tons of props in the comments. 
Where was I? Oh, right. We really pride ourselves on trying to make sure your generosity is rewarded, so please go check out the tiers and see if any of that tickles your fancy. And actually, speaking of fancy tickling, that came out wrong. It sounded better in my head. We'll fix it in post. Uh, Zoe, please insert a smooth transition of me talking about our new merch in the EC store. Exactly, bud. And you know, since you just yes anded me so perfectly there, I'd like to show off this amazing new shirt showing off you enjoying all of the topics we cover in Extra Credits. It is adorable, and I love the fact that my cat is a beautiful history, mythology, literature, and game design loving nerd now on all the clothing I can wear. Not to mention, we also do a monthly pin votes, again, voted by the patrons, so you can snazz up a blazer or a backpack or a collar. Huh? And actually, the whole store itself just got a glow up. We got tons of stuff there we don't really talk about much. Plushies of Game & Zoe, other shirts, uh, posters, a uh, coffee mug with Game's face on it. I'm actually drinking coffee out of one of those objects right now. I'll let you guess which one. So whether you'd like to help forge the future of Extra History on Patreon, want to join a awesome community, or just want some sweet swag that, uh, again, I am so freaking proud of, please consider supporting our channel by visiting one or both of the links below. We would very much appreciate it. And if you've made it to this point of this ad read for ourselves, I don't know. I feel like you might be the kind of person who would enjoy all the, the sweet perks that comes along with that stuff. So please check it out. And if you do, dare I say you'll be joining the fantabulous ranks of the following folks. Well, shucks howdy there, Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, and Skylar Holmes. Thanks so much for being legendary patrons. 